Итак, у кого из вас есть Библии, можете открыть вместе со мной знакомое для нас место Писания, в котором сокрыто бездна богатства, премудрости, ведения Божией, достоинстве неисследимого наследия Христова. Евангелие Матфея, глава 5, стихи 45-48. «Да будете сынами Отца вашего Небесного, ибо Он повелевает Солнцу Своему восходить над злыми и добрыми, и посылает дождь, на праведных и неправедных. Итак, будьте совершенны, как совершен Отец ваш Небесный. Если Бог призвал нас к этому совершенству, то это означает, что это возможно. А посему проповедь, которую я продолжу, так и называется «Призванные к совершенству». Это на самом деле обетованная заповедь, является наследием святых всех времен и поколений, и адресована эта заповедь Христом сугубо или же исключительно только своим ученикам. А посему люди, не признающие над собой власти человека, посланного Богом, к наследию этой заповеди никакого отношения еще никогда не имели и навряд ли уже когда-нибудь смогут иметь. В связи с исполнением этой повелевающей заповеди – быть совершенными, как совершен Отец наш Небесный, мы остановились на назначении правильной которая будет обуславливать сердце Божьего сердце Божьего сердца which symbolized the death of Christ. He died for our sins so that we may be righteous before God. This was the symbol of the broken tablets of the covenant where we, by the law, died for the law so that we could live for the one that died and resurrected so that we can then receive confirmation of our salvation in the new tablets of the covenant in the format of the law of the spirit of life that is in the resurrection of Christ in order to give God the ability to give to us the promise to be inherit the heirs of his peace just like he gave it to Abraham and his seed <clears throat> and by doing so receive con confirmation of our salvation for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith Romans 4.13 we note that the righteousness of faith is determined by the obedience of our faith to the faith of God which is presented in the preached word of God sent and the person who is a father from God to us there is God's faith there is our faith God's faith as we've noted is information that comes from the mouth of God faith is from hearing the word of God not what we will be reading you can read as much as you'd like you can memorize it but the faith will not grow faith grows from hearing the preached word that is anointed by the Holy Spirit by the person that is specifically sent to teach us how do you preach if you are not sent there is a problem in the nation of God that all preach they give people the ability to preach but we need to give to those who are given the word and the word is given to men or to women that is in essence what it is but religion re refuses these things they do not want to accept this the unfortunate thing about religion in order to be nourished by living faith they are continuing to function based on religious ideas and customs our faith is obedience to the information that comes from the faith of God and so the promise of the peace of God is given only to those men who are clothed or clothed themselves into the virtue of a student which has allowed them to be obedient to the order of God in accordance to which God sends us his word by the mouth of his delegated one therefore the covenant of peace within the heart of a man is the result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God which are the spoken by word by God words from his delegated ones 
In a specific format, we've already looked at six signs by which we need to determine and examine ourselves as to whether we are the sons of peace as well as the sons of God and have been studying the seventh sign. Because not all are called the sons of God in Scripture. When God calls, there are many called they, that are called. They are not called sons of God in Scripture. These are the sons of destruction. These overfill the churches. But there, there are the chosen from these many called, the multitude of the called. And so those who are called typically have their own mind. They don't acknowledge the person God has sent. They select one for themselves and tell this person then what they are to say and what they're not to say. And so the seventh sign by which we need to determine that we are a part of the sons of peace is by the ability to clothe our essence into the holy and selective love of God. Holy love of God, holy is not a tolerant love, it's a selective love. Holy, it separates, it cannot love everyone in general as typically people uh, people say behind or on the stage that God loves everyone. Where did you get that idea? A holy God has no longer or is no longer a holy God then. The scriptures say God loves the righteous and hates the lawless. God does not listen to the prayer of a sinner. He listens to the prayer of his righteous one that has repented. But when a sinner acknowledges the fact that he's a sinner, God then sees him as righteous. He acknowledges the fact that he's a sinner and he comes to repent. You know, in the law, there was such a requirement if someone has a leprosy and he comes and the priest will examine him and the, le the leprosy has covered his whole body, he needs to be announced as pure. But if, if there's even one area on his body that was not leprous, then he was not yet pure because he relies still upon this area that is not leprous. I still have something. I'm not as bad as people think. When you understand that any sin completely makes you a sinner, that is when this humility makes you and you see God looks at you in this situation and says, proclaim before the nation that he's pure. This is the essence of God's holy and selective love. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Colossians 3, 14, 15. We have noted that according to this place of scripture, the reign of the peace of God within our heart is possible only upon one condition, and that is if the selective love of God will abide within our heart, and if we will be clothed into the selective love of God. Again, we're talking here about our relationship with one another in one body. In the selective love of God, which is the atmosphere of the peace of God, we see concealed the good, wonderful, eternal, and uncomprehending for the human mind goals and works of God called to build a unique and peaceful relationship between God and exclusively with His children. God never planned to make a, or build a relationship with this world. The world is condemned. Apostle John wrote, Do not love the world or what is in the world. For everything that is in the world is the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It is not from the Father, but is from the world. God did not love the world. This is an incorrect translation of the original where it says, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And further down in this very chapter, do not love the world or what's in the world. Because it is written, God so loved the world, the people that are in this world that are his, so that they may have everlasting life. He did not love the world itself. This is the translator that incorrectly translated this place. It was necessary to write so for God so loved each one who believes in this world that he gave his only begotten son because he gave himself for everyone who believes in him that they not perish but have everlasting life but the world is condemned <laughs> 
And the end, the verdict is to be fulfilled. Everything is turning red. The sunset is near. But the scriptures say, rise, lift up your heads, for your salvation is near. In scripture, the character of the selective love of God is presented by the Holy Spirit in scripture by the preached word of the apostles and prophets in the form of seven unchanging elements, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Second Peter 1, 2 through 8. In a specific format, we've already looked at the demonstration of the selective love of God and the qualities of virtue, knowledge, self-control, and perseverance, and stop to study the virtue of the love of God in the mystery of great godliness. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 And we've noted that all of this God had demonstrated by through his church, using his church, that it may be known through the church to the powers and principalities in heaven, the many forms of God's wisdom, and also on earth, you are a light to the world. God has passed on the mandate of his life that is contained within his life to his disciples so that they may be a light and would carry that light. And hell knows the people of the light by name. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Look today how many the, in these false charismatic churches there is a, a work of rebuking demons. As soon as a person comes there, they immediately receive a revelation that you have a spirit of fornication, a spirit of, of some other kind of sin, and they're going to rebuke it. And the entire church, thousands of people begin to shake their hands and and so what all saints now take part in these sinful things what are people calling them to or they press your stomach it says spit out the spirit of fornication and are also shaking out the spirit of other sins there is one that's called as Derek Prince he is the one that implemented this spitting out of demons. He said being baptized by the Holy Spirit would become possessed. He wrote about this in his books. I read them. You say, how? And people believed in this because they... And they write as this doctor of theology writes. He'll have to answer for this because he brought mass amount of people into deception, although he is very religious. His ideas have expanded t throughout uh, the, the, the people and these false charismatic services, churches have received this very idea instead of being reverent before God and listening to the word of God with trembling. Relevant to this fact, we came to the necessity to look at four classical questions. What characteristics do the scriptures ascribe to the godliness of God and that of man? What purpose is the godliness called to fulfill within the relationship of God with man and man with God? What conditions do we need to fulfill in order to collaborate our godliness with the godliness of God? And what, by what signs do we identify that our godliness is truly collaborating with the godliness or goodness of God? In a specific format, we've already looked at the first three questions and stopped to study the signs of question four by which we can identify that we are collaborating our godliness with the goodness of God. Because godliness is God's favor, it's God's goodwill. Four signs have already been subjects that we've studied, therefore we will immediately turn to look 
at the fifth sign, the fifth sign by which we can examine ourselves and determine that we are demonstrating the selective love of God and are collaborating our godliness with the goodness of God is by the result of saving the city of Zoar so that you can find safety there from the indignation, burning wrath of God. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your daughters where, who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hands, his wife's hands, and the hands of his daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him, they brought him out and sent him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, then he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please know, my lord, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy which you have shown me by saving my life. And he says again, Please know, my lord. You have increased your mercy which you have shown me by saving my life, but I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow the city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city is called Zoar. Genesis 19, 15 through 22. Sometimes it seems strange. Why did he ask God about this? And why the holy God that wanted to destroy Zoar because they were no different than the other cities in their lawlessness? Why, for Lot's sake, he makes the decision to save Noah or or Lot in this place. We need to immediately note that when studying the events that took place with Lot in the Canaanite land who lived in the plains of Sodom that is laid out in the valley of Sedem, which is on the shores of the Dead Sea, we need to remember that the Canaanite land is a symbol of our mortal body. After the conquering of the Canaanite land by the Israelite nation, it began to be called the land of Israel. This is a symbol of our heavenly body. Abraham who lived in the Canaanite land within the boundaries of Hebron by the terebinth trees of Mamre is a symbol of our new person born from the seed of the word of truth living within our body which made a union with the truth of the word in the symbol of Mamre whose name means word that when we look at it as in a mirror we see ourselves Lot who lived in the Canaanite land in the valley of Sedem at the shores of the Dead Sea is a symbol of our soul that lives within our mortal body. The five Canaanite cities that were located at the shores of the Dead Sea in the valley of Sedem is a symbol of the five physical senses that function in the mortal body that give a person the ability to know the physical world. This is vision, hearing, smell, feel, and taste about which we will be talking individually when identifying Zoar. The five cities, including the city of Zoar, with the territories of the plains, were laid out in the valley of Sedem, in the southeastern shores of the Dead Sea. However, unlike the other four cities, the city of Zoar was in the rocky areas of the shores of the Dead Sea, the same location that today is the Jordania. I was there, and from the angle of the Jordan, being in, uh, in Jordan, you can't access the Dead Sea. And I was able to see where they uh, take water from the very Dead Sea, and they uh, work that water to obtain the white uh, powder that is because they have such valuable mineral and it is sold for a very high price. Those who study say that the wealth of all the world will not be enough to pay 
or to compare with the wealth of what the Dead Sea contains, all of the water is filled with precious things. There are such rare minerals there that you will rarely find anywhere else and there there's a multitude of it and they knowing these things and they export all these things and that is what Israel mainly that's the currency or the income of Israel today the destroyed by God nations that were by the shores of the Dead Sea that before their destruction by fire were flourishing as the Garden of Eden where there was a surprising climate where they where these cities lie were to be for the Israelite nation a visible example of what will be with those people whose heart turns away from the Lord. For the reason of a man's dependence on the emotional aspect of his soul, being strayed away by the corrupt lusts that burn in the old person with his deeds. In other words, that is what was happening within these cities, so that there may not be among you men or women or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses him, himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my heart. As though the drunkard could be included with the sober, the Lord would not spare him for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven and the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law so that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say when they see the plagues of the land and the sickness which the Lord has laid on it the whole land is brimstone salt and burning it is sown it is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which are the, which the Lord overthrew in His anger and His wrath. Deuteronomy 29:18 through 23. We were upon this place with my wife. We saw the burned. You see this entire. Uh, place and all of the ro uh, the roadways that are there they were this place in Israel is cursed not a single thing grows there not one thing grows there and the heat is overwhelming we would raise in the morning and it was about a hundred and six degrees Fahrenheit just when you wake up in the morning and it was impossible to come or even come out from where we were because it was so hot. That is how this land is there. But God has promised when he comes that he, he, when he returns to reign here for that thousand years, the millennial year, he will again restore this glorious climate that once was there and the earth will once again bud and spring. By the measure of their wickedness, the city of Zawar, although was not as great as the other four cities, nevertheless was not in any different from Sodom and Gomorrah and was intended to be destroyed by fire, but for the sake of Lot, God had promised not to destroy this small city. We need to note that the intercession prayer of Abraham where he attempted to protect from the wrath of God the five cities that were located at the shores of the Dead Sea. God promised Abraham that if, if in these cities he finds ten righteous men, then for the sake of these he will spare these cities. This intercession was not successful because there was not found ten righteous men. And then God, because of the prayer of Abraham, brought the righteous Lot out with his two daughters from Sodom from the plains that Lot lived, and because of the prayer of Lot, he did not destroy the small city of Zoar. We ask the question, why God, to Lot's benefit, who found favor in his eyes, spare the small city of Zoar? Or what prompted God to obey Lot and agree with him so that he not destroy the small, small Zoar that in measure of their wickedness was no different from the other cities, but 
actually was their gray cardinal. They were even worse than these other cities were. This was the very the very the worst city, the most wicked city amongst the five. Answering this question, we need to consider the fact that the city of Zoar for Lot was the city of safety from the wrath of God. In this city, God saved Lot from his wrath. As soon as Lot came to Zoar, that became for him the city of safety where God saved him from anger of his wrath with which he burned with fire Sodom and Gomorrah and the plains of the city the city of Zoar became for Lot the city of salvation therefore although that is the case Lot after his salvation in Zoar came out from it and lived in the mountains that is in one of the caves that was fairly available in the places where he was then Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains and his two daughters were with, were with him for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar and he and his daughters dwelt in the cave Genesis 19 30 in order to understand the vital for us meaning of the city of Zoar in the work of God's redemption in Christ we will look at the very name of the city this little city was called Billa before that was in the name of the king of the city who and this his name means contradictory and so this very city of Zoar that was a symbol of the five senses of uh, five senses as our taste or symbol of our mouth that although it is small it is the door by which our body can it, that into our body either the Lord or devil can enter by the means of our tongue or our mouth this is the small member but does much independence of our decision can take part either in the work of our salvation or in the work of our destruction without it it is not possible to save it is not possible without the tongue to, to be saved although it is the great cardinal of wickedness this very situation prompted God not to destroy Zoar but for Abraham and Lot make it a place of safety from the, his burning wrath of holiness a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruits of his mouth from the produce of his lips he shall be filled death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits Proverbs 18 20 through 21 Apostle James in his uh, talking to his brothers who wanted to be teachers he identified the tongue and its qualities and he explained the fact that it defiles everything around itself and also is burning within the body because it prompts the corrupt lusts within the body my brethren let not many of you become teachers knowing that he will receive a stricter judgment for we are all for we all stumble in many things if anyone does not stumble in word he is a perfect man able to also bridle the whole body indeed he puts bits in horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole their whole body look also as ships although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires even so the tongue in a little is a little member and boasts great things see how great a forest the little fire kindles and the tongue is in such a position in our body that it it, it defiles literally our entire body a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell and James 3 1 through 6 the caves that were in the plains of Zoar is a symbol of the death of the Lord Jesus where we are called to consider ourselves dead to sin living for God proclaiming the not existent as existent and in order to do this it is necessary to be good or to righteous in your genesis or your beginnings Lot was righteous in his genesis brood of vipers how can you bring evil 
being evil, speak good things. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bring forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word man may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your word you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, 34 through 37. If a person confesses this truth as that is from his conscience, that is not cleansed from dead works, and his confessions that will be viewed by God as witchcraft, which indicates the fact that he does not have God's favor, that God would be able to uh, respond to. If a person confesses this truth, leaving Zoar and living in the mountain, which is a symbol of the promise called to by the death of the Lord Jesus to deliver him from the power of the old person who lives in his body and by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus to erect within his body the stronghold of life, then his uh, goodness will collaborate with the goodness of God. The sixth sign by which we can determine ourselves and uh, examine and determine that we are demonstrating the selective love of God and are collaborating our godliness with the goodness of God is by the result of the state of our heart, which is in the likeness of a child. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, Luke 10, 21. According to this place of scripture, we conclude that our uh, our favor toward God, with, to which God will respond with his favor, is the state of our heart, which is in the likeness of a child. Furthermore, an infant to whom God has revealed himself within his son, Jesus Christ, and for whom the son thanked his father for are his students. He called them uh, little children in this moment when he had thanked his heavenly father. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All these things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and have not heard it. Luke 10, 16 through 24. We need to ask the question, by what criteria do we examine <clears throat> and identify the state of our heart, whether it is according to a heart of a child? The state of the heart of the disciples was in the thoughts, words, and actions. <clears throat> it will be necessary to examine this and the obedience of their faith to the faith of God in their words and their actions, how much it is in accordance to the heart of an infant. Identifying the nature of mentality, the nature of word that is confessing this mentality and the acts that are done, when you follow Christ, we will look at the state of the heart of an infant or a child so that we can examine ourselves. These act, the, the thought, the word, and the act that comes from, from this are all in one, all the same, and they need to be following Christ and work as one or in one command or as one army.
And so to examine in ourselves these three, whether they do work together as one command or as one army, we need to examine ourselves by four signs. First sign of a heart being like the heart of a child is the ability of a student to desire the pure milk of the word as a newborn babe. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, m when we're talking about milk, the milk of a mother, to love the pure milk of the word, desire pure milk of the word, that milk of the church, your ch uh, the mother which is your church, your, per your church. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking before you love or desire this milk, you need to do something. Cast off the old man with his deeds. As a newborn babe, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 5. To build yourself into a precious house. We see here spiritual house, a holy priesthood. If you have not loved or desired the pure milk of the word, you will not be able to do anything for yourself out of it or without it. To desire in this place of scripture means to want something a lot or greatly. The want to immediately get to know it, to be filled with hunger and thirst. Yearn in waiting to know, understand it with trembling and joy. Continuously abide in it, Medi uh, meditate about it day and night. Make it an element of your praise. Worship before him and be deluded in him. Second sign of a heart being like the heart of a child is the ability of a student to imitate Christ as infants imitate their parents. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 8, 12. In the original of the Greek language, the phrase to follow Jesus is to follow his footsteps, to imitate him, to be in his likeness, or the likeness of his lifestyle. Serving Jesus, not following his footsteps, not imitating him, not being in or being in accordance to the form of life he lived, means that you're serving someone else and calling it as Jesus. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. John 12, 25 through 26. Third sign of a heart being like the heart of a child is a pure heart that did not have holes for foxes and nests for birds which help infants differentiate the voice of their mother from foreign voices. And this is talking about tens of thousands of other mothers. Men of study have come to the conclusion that an infant can differentiate the voice of his mother, the timbre of his mother, from tens of thousands of others. If you can imagine for yourself, the indicator a child house, he can differentiate it. And when he hears this voice, even this voice itself it brings him peace. This voice is somewhere near. This is very important. When he hears foreign voices, he begins to become impatient. He becomes afraid because he does not, if he does not hear the voice of his mother nearby, that's how infants behave. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Matthew 8, 19, 20. The heart of an infant is such a heart where there is no hole for foxes and no nests for birds. Uh, 
And so the symbol of holes for foxes in the heart is the category of people that depend on profits that are impacted by the spirit of poverty or affected by the spirit of, of deception that prophesy being uh, from their own personal heart that is not their spirit. The symbol of a nest for birds in the heart represents the category of people that have within their heart a false uh, strongholds. And these strong, uh, the strongholds within him, he perceives as the strongholds of God. You need to know the word well, because when someone says something, you may ask, where is it written? God loves everyone, someone will tell you, and you'll say, show me one place of scripture that shows that God loves everyone in general, a holy and good God. That means a holy and good God has no longer or will, is no longer a holy God. Do you love your neighbor's children that go outside every day and bully your children? Do you love them, these children? Of course, you are unhappy with them, these children. You don't love them because these children are constantly inter in disturbing your children. The world is the enemy and not a holy person. An unclean will always bully the, the clean or the pure. God can't love them the same. He loves the one and hates the other, and he will defend his children. At the same time, an absence of this uh, holes for foxes within your heart indicates the, the fact that the heart of a person, the authority of this person is the preached word. The absence in the heart of these nests within, for birds also indicates in the heart that it is cleansed from dead works. An infant does not yet have that organ that uh, has not yet formed that organ that would be able to uh, utilize uh, the uh, corruption uh, that is within him or to activate it. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensations, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you, and these are people who do not acknowledge God's delegated authority over themselves. I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Gen uh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Fourth sign of a heart being like the heart of a child is the requirement to react and respond to evil that has been done against us as a child reacts and responds to it. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. This means that infants don't have the organ uh, that reacts uh, to bitterness. They react to the pain, but they don't have jealousy or bitterness or hate against someone. I've noticed this in my little children when uh, they were needing to be punished for some kind of fault. They are crying, but they still stretch out their hands to you for, for you to take them. This is how children behave to pain. Try when God corrects you to stretch out your hands to him. Some begin to complain and be become rebellious. And so correction is a form of love. God demonstrates his love in correction. He does not correct the wicked or the unclean. They, for themselves, are rolling into hell. They were holy, then converted themselves into the wicked, and they think that as everything is as butter, that their, their actions, their way of life is in accordance to God's will, which is not the case. The seventh sign by which we can examine ourselves and determine that we are demonstrating the selective love of God and are collaborating our godliness 
with the goodness of God is by the result of when a king that is in us is a son of the nobles and our princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Ecclesiastes 10, 17. Blessed is goodwill or the favor of God which is his response to the favor uh, of, of a land. The symbol of the land is the symbol of our spiritual soil as well as our physical body. This allegory is addressed to those people who has a king who rules over, them, over that rules over them and he is from a noble line and the princes that are there also eat timely and it is for strength and not for drunkenness to draw God's favor upon your your land it is necessary to demonstrate your favor toward him demonstrate this in the kings that are from a noble line and the princes that eat timely for strength a prince that is a king that is from a noble line is the mind of Christ that re demonstrates or represents our body and the intelligent aspect of our new person. The prince or princes that eat timely are the symbol of the rule of our informational organ renewed by the spirit of our mind over the emotional organ of our soul. This is. And so, again, this is when it comes to the emotional aspect, he is a prince from a noble line who rules over this emotional aspect. First, by what signs do we identify the goodness or the favor of God within our land? By what signs do we identify that within our spirit there is a king from the sons of the nobles? And this means that we are led by the Holy Spirit, accepted the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life. Third, by what signs do we determine that the intelligent aspect of our soul as our prince is renewed by the spirit of our mind? And how do we identify the food as well as the amount of food that is necessary for our king so that he eat for strength and not for drunkenness? If we do not have answers to these questions, we will no way be able to examine ourselves whether we are being led by the Holy Spirit, who is a Lord from a, a noble line or the rule of our informational organ that is renewed by the spirit of our mind over the emotional aspect and organ of our soul, which is our prince. Not understanding the food that our prince needs to be nourished by, which is our mind, which is renewed by the spirit of our mind, for strength and not for drunkenness. Furthermore, we will not be able to examine ourselves whether we collaborate our favor with God's favor. First question, by what signs do we identify the goodness or the favor of God within our land, which is the soil of our heart and our body that is from this, land, from this earth? According to the testimonies of scripture, the good or goodness of God to our land is to be identified by our favor, that is, our hunger and our thirst uh, for the promise of the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ or the renewing of our house, that is, our body. If we have hunger and thirst, that our body will be renewed, the house in which we live, that it will be renewed, then this talks about the fact that we already have upon ourselves God's favor because God favors toward those that have the calling to renew their house, adopt their body by the redemption of Christ. Psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the house of David. This psalm was uh, dedicated for the dedication of the house of David, that is the renewing of our body, the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive. When in the body we have the old man, old person, our soul is in hell at this time because our emotions are inflamed by the fire that is from hell that within our body represents the old person that's reigning sin 
And he says, you have led my soul, brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. You have to die for your nation, the house of your father, and your destructive will or desires. And then the Lord in resurrection will lead your soul or bring your soul up from the grave when this reigning sin in the old form of the old person will be bound within our body, will be removed from the throne and kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was troubled. I cried out, cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. I cried out to you, O Lord. I made supplication, what profit is there in my blood? When I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned from me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Psalm 31 through 12. If we do not find ourselves within this revelation, then that means that Uh, that is if we do find ourselves if we do discover and find identify ourselves with this psalm then the Lord has turned our sorrow into gladness we know that by faith we have all these things the question of time remains that is within God's control when he suddenly will say to his son my son I allow you I give you permission to change the body of your students and take them to yourself and then in the blink of an eye their bodies of the saints will be clothed into perfection they died in faith uh, even those who have died in faith not having achieved that perfection that they without us would not achieve that perfection and then in the beginning he will resurrect the dead our bodies will be transformed in the blink of an eye will be then joined with them and for a specific time they and us will be on earth and then it will become very unsweet it will be very bitter for those religious mausoleums that uh, condemn one another and they are no different from one another in essence. Second question, by what signs do we identify that within our spirit there is a king from the sons of the nobles, that is the Holy Spirit that is received by us as our Lord and Master, the king from a noble line as the Holy Spirit that represents in our spirit the mind of Christ pursues the goal of God that is linked to our primary purpose and that is to make our body a house of prayer and in the stronghold of eternal life, adopt our body by the redemption of Christ. How do we identify in ourselves? Do we have this king from the no noble princes at the same time reigning sin within our body in the form of the old person pursues the goal that is linked to worshiping mammon and satisfying the corrupt desires of the soul? For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with a habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, not prepared for evangelism, but so that, that death may be devoured or consumed by life in the body, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we always being confident, knowing that while we are at the, 
at home in the body we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be ab absent from the body and be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 7, we proclaim the not existent as existent, that is, our body being adopted by the redemption of Christ, then this means that who rules our land is a king from the nobles. If you have this, I trust you have this as I have this, then you have a king from the nobles. Third question, by what signs do we determine that the intelligent aspect of our soul as our prince is renewed by the spirit of our mind? According to the testimony of scripture, identifying that the intelligent aspect of our soul in the form of our uh, prince is renewed by the spirit of our mind is by our behave or reaction to the mind of Christ, which is the intelligent aspect of our new person that has come grown into full measure of growth in Christ. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God. There are holy people that have received salvation, but decided to make, uh, compare or level their mind with God's mind. Their, in, their mind with God's mind. I have my own head, they say. Not with their heart do they hear and want to hear and see, but all by their physical eyes and their intellect, which is given to uh, understand the physical world, not the spiritual world. And if that's not enough, they, they put it, make it or set it equal to God's mind. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, they are arrogant and pride, prideful about their own uh, wisdom or not knowledge. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom. And so that we, due to ignorance, not put our mind equal to God's mind, we need to grow into full measure of growth in Christ so that by the way of total sanctification, we receive the right and power to total dedication where the Holy Spirit would receive the proper grounds to enter into our heart in the form of the, our Lord and our Master so that He can reveal to us the truth so that, that we are receiving into our heart. Behold, you desire the truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom, Psalm 51, 6. And so having within yourself the Holy Spirit as who reveals this truth that was previously received into our heart is having in our heart this tower. Because of having a tower within your spirit in the form of two uh, great witnesses, the Thummim and the Urim, we are able to hear in our heart the revelation of the voice of the Holy Spirit and the truth about the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ. And God then receives the ability to hear our voice so that he can receive the, the right to hear our voice, we then consider ourselves dead to sin, living for God, proclaiming the non-existent as existent. And you need to live and behave according to that as you live in a new house. You know what will happen when you do this. There will be a specific uh, conservation, as it were, when you will uh, behave this way. Holiness then uh, preserves your body. It no longer begins to decay your body. And this is before it's renewed. When you uh, say purchase fruits or vegetables, then but salt or sugar uh, stops the process of, of these things, of, ro of rotting. Uh, although it's there and the product does not get get bad or or uh, is not needing to be tossed away um, it is the same thing as with us this is not just fruits and vegetables this could be any kind of other food as well and this is again due to the salt of holiness in your body because you consider yourself dead to sin living for God so that we understand that this will happen if you will continuously look at who God is for you what he's done for you who you are for him and what you need to do so that God would be able to give to us everything that 
is ours. So God can hear our voice when we consider ourselves dead to sin, living for Him, proclaiming the not existent as existent, the heavenly body as existent. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. Again, you only know your thoughts and if it's not clearly written, the promise that you have received, if it's not clearly written upon your heart, then when God as the reader will try to read it, he will not be able to see it or accomplish it for you. It needs to be very clearly written upon tablets, this promise that God gives to you. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3. When you wait for it this way, then a preservation of the body, the quality of corruption that is in the body stops. Upon practice, we could see here that the intelligent aspect of our soul as our prince is renewed by the spirit of our mind. For by what signs do we identify the food as well as the amount of food that is necessary for these princes so that he, they eat for strength and not for drunkenness? We're talking here about imperishable food, of course, uh, supernatural food that is presented as the promises of God that identify with, uh, are identified as the unsearchable inheritance of Jesus Christ. And so therefore the food of our princes in the form of our intelligent aspect of our soul is the word of God that comes from the mouth of God in, from the mouth of the one that is a father God of God for us. For the, all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. 2 Corinthians 1.20 The measure of food that turns God's favor upon our land is our the relationship of our prince with hope and trust that is demonstrated in hunger and thirst. But when it comes to eating it with for drunkenness, the spiritual food that turns God's favor away from us is the absence of hunger and thirst in this prince, not wanting to hear the word of God and the absence of trembling when you listen to the word of God. And so when it says uh, you ate and you don't have any more hunger or thirst, there needs to be constantly a hunger and thirst for the word of God. In experience, however much revelations I may receive, the more I receive them, they prompt within me a hunger and thirst for more understanding. The thirst is stronger, the hunger is stronger to understand. Knowledge itself, it, it makes one arrogant, but love, it edifies, because we can only know the love of God in our relationship with one another. In the book of Revelations, we see our relationship with the Word of God, and that is when it talks about eating for drunkenness, it's also as in the symbol of leaving your first love, Revelations 2, 3 through 5. You have preser persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent, Revelations 2, 3 through 5. And so, again, this is when you see you're leaving your first love, when you don't have a draw for God, when you use the gifts of God and the abilities that he has given for the flesh. When eating for drunkenness, this is not just the absence of the first love. 
to uh, listening to the truth or the word of the truth, this eating for drunkenness is also the atmosphere in the heart of love, which is uh, replaced then with arrogance of knowledge and pride and forsaking the truth of the word. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3. Drunkenness, eating for drunkenness, is changing your priorities where your goals that are God's in adopting our body by the redemption of Christ are replaced with satisfying uh, the desires of the flesh and thoughts. Eating for drunkenness is idol worshiping, where you worship demonic, the demonic prince uh, Mammon, that as if saves a person from poverty. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance will increase this also is vanity. When, God's, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun, riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing in his hands. As he came from his mother's womb naked, shall he return to go as he came, and he shall take nothing from his labor which he may, that he may carry away in, the, in his hand. And this also is a severe evil, just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who has labored for the wind? All his days he also eats in darkness, and he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all the labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life when God gives him. For it is his heritage and for every man to whom God has given riches and a wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Ecclesiastes 5.10 through 19. Summing up this question, we need to conclude that the good that is promised by God for our land is placed in direct dependence of our favor toward God. And so the favor of God that consists in this prince that is from a, a noble line and the princes that eat for their strength and not for drunkenness. This is our choice and our responsibility to make this happen. And so if we are led by the Holy Spirit, then this means that in our body, our king is from a noble line. And at our table, we see our servant, which is our prince, that using the intelligent aspect of the soul, hungers and thirsts for the revelations and trembles before these revelations. And this means that our favor that is demonstrated in listening to the word of God collaborates with the favor of God. Amen. L let us bend our heads and our knees and we will pray. And may the Lord bless us in this prayer all those who desire to resist the old person with his deeds, illnesses that are within the body in order to be healed we wait for you here at the altar we will pray for you and may the Lord bless us
I'm going to be praying your prayer. Please close your eyes. This is your secret room. Lift your hands to God. A sign that you're ready and that your hands are lifted up without wrath or doubt. Pray together with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you. I open up my heart. You see my pain. You see my dependence from the corrupt lusts of my soul that I hate and in the power of which I am. Deliver me from their power. Heal my soul. Lead it out from hell. I accept your authority and I bind my old person with his deeds within my body and I thank you for this power. May illnesses be cursed in my body and may corruption stop in its tracks. I thank you for your righteousness that I have in the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And right now, before heaven and hell, I want to proclaim that in accordance to your words, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am healed, I am restored, I am justified, and I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May he look upon you with his great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they won't touch you. May upon you the promises of the ancient mountains and everlasting hills be upon you in the covenant you have with God. May you be blessed. You are going in, going out and going in. May the hand of the Most High be upon you and the enemies of the earth fear you. May this be upon you and your children. And the nation shall say, Amen. Blessed is the Lord and blessed is His mercy for us. Continue to look at the invisible and meditate about it proclaim it and then God will give you the proper basis to preserve your body from corruption and prepare it for the renewing I have a letter dear pastor we would like to become members of this church I will ask you to please come out you may not yet be fully familiar with these people. They recently came from our church that is in Europe, and I will ask you to please welcome them. Right now, we will pray, we will thank him, we will thank God, we will accept them and into the body. Please stretch out your, your hand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these saints that 
today according to their will accept into the ranks of this army and they will then serve for us a blessing and we would be a blessing for them may they be blessed before your face in this wonderful order in this church and may we be blessed in fellowship with them amen thank you you may take your seats